<clears throat> okay, good afternoon. So I'll be talking about the risk factors for glaucoma surgery failure in not just particularly trabeculectomy. We'll just have a peek at what the risk factors have, how they influence the other glaucoma surgeries too. So I'll be picking up from where Professor Koshik left that trabeculectomy is a long journey and for any long journey, we do our preparations of packing and booking our tickets quite well in advance. So looking at your patient when they come to you at baseline and eventually when they evolve over the treatment of medical therapy and, <clears throat> excuse me, until the time you take the decision to do the surgery is very important and all these gamut of risk factors influence the outcome. It starts right from the beginning when the patient comes to you till that you are decision making. So the patient's age, their race, the nature of the glaucoma, any prior ocular surgery, ocular surface disease, uh, the blepharitis, their lid status, the long-term topical anti-glaucoma drugs, and the refractive status in terms of myopia, all of these influence the outcome of trabeculectomy. When we look at preoperative intraocular pressure, uh, the literature is very controversial on this matter. Rather, I couldn't really find a concrete answer to this. There's a questionable influence of preoperative intraocular pressure on the effectiveness and eventual success of the surgery. The high preoperative intraocular pressure levels may be associated with a higher likelihood of surgical failure as per most of the surgeries. The impact, however, may vary depending upon individual patient characteristics, which include other ocular comorbidities in response to prior therapy. And low preoperative intraocular pressure is not an independent risk factor for hypotony post a trabeculectomy surgery. Looking at age, we all know young patients throw up a profuse inflammatory reaction. So there is an increased likelihood of postoperative fibrosis and inflammatory response in these patients, not just in trabeculectomy, but also in trabeculotomy when we talk of congenital glaucomas or in GDD. And there is an increased risk of failure for the first time tubes in younger patients with almost a one third reduction of failure with each three year increase in age. Preoperative medications we all know can wreak a havoc on the eye. Uh, so anybody who is taking more than four drugs or taking multiple medications for over three years or those who have been on oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, they are more likely to have a bad course uh, after a trabeculectomy. So we really need to be more watchful for fibrosis in the early post-operative period in such patients. Patients who have been taking long-term uh, prostaglandins have peri prostaglandin associated periorbitopathy, which makes the lids quite thick, and that can influence the uh, pressure that these lids put on the blebs that we have created. Preoperative presence of PAP has been shown to worsen the one-year success rate of TRAB and POAG patients. And it's important that we address this issue well in time because once we know that subtle signs of PAP have started appearing, it's a good idea to shift your patients because you want to have an eventual successful outcome of any surgery which you may need to do for these patients in future. Ocular surface disease, although we all know about it, that there is an increased risk of ocular surface disease with multiple medications and we think that giving pro preservative free drugs is a panacea for that, but that's not really the case. Several studies have shown that still there is an element of inflammation at the subconjunctival level whenever the patients are putting uh, multiple medications because the primary salt of the drug itself is contributory to this. So patients on multiple medications can have Delin post-surgery as we can see in this patient with uh, post-trabeculectomy. The patient was putting five drugs prior to surgery and uh, the scenario post-trabeculectomy is no better. There is an increased risk of infection after glaucoma surgery in patients with compromised ocular surface. Back-related drugs can definitely make it even more uh, bad for the outcome. The rate of bleb failure has secondary to subconjunctival fibrosis and rate of encapsulation of the bleb has been shown to be as high as 50% at five years, which goes up to nearly 60% at around 15 years. So it's a good idea to address your ocular surface disease prior to surgery. And you know, you must prime your patient and tell them that they have to be taking up uh, their 
uh, drops in, um, there, there are many times when we write a preservative drug, but when the patient gets it from the chemist, they get a preservative, it, the drug with a preservative because that's relatively inexpensive. So you have to tell your patient when you're prescribing them a preservative-free drug that this may cost a little more, but eventually for the success of an eventual surgery, this is likely to be a contributory positive factor. Delin-like keratopathy not only just exists with post-trabeculectomy, it has also been seen post-implants. Um, this is something that we often ignore. We are so focused at the pressures, the perimetry, the optic disc, that we forget to look at the lid. Myobomin gland dysfunction has been seen in nearly 80% of patients who are using anti-glaucoma drugs. It's really, really important to address this, although it may seem innocuous, but it compromises the post-operative uh, status of a trap. The rate of infections in patients with MGD is much, much higher and giving preoperative doxycycline if somebody has um, myobomin gland dysfunction can make things a little better. Endophthalmitis after trabeculectomy has also been linked to chronic blepharitis. Now, certain types of glaucoma by virtue of being more inflammatory in nature also compromise the post-operative outcome. So uveitic glaucomas, neovascular glaucomas, traumatic glaucoma, and even steroid-induced glaucoma, they may increase the risk of failure post a trabeculectomy. When we talk about steroid-induced glaucoma, this is way more common than we actually see because in most of the rural and the semi-urban areas, steroids are prescribed right, left, and center, not just by doctors, but also by chemists. So older children or those with long duration of uh, spring catarrh or vernal keratoconjunctivitis, or those taking long duration of steroids, with larger cup disc ratios and having a mixed type of steroid use have been found to be significantly associated with qualified failure of a trabeculectomy. So this is something we need to look, we need to even avert the lids of our younger glaucoma patients and if they have uh, uh, VKC or any other allergic conjunctivitis, we need to really dig out the history of prior use of uh, steroids in these patients. Prior ocular surgeries also add more trauma to uh, the ocular surface. They, the postoperative subconjunctival fibrosis after an incisional ophthalmic surgery has been found to be much more because there is a recruitment of conjunctival fibroblast and inflammatory cells in the local area, and these will get active the moment we do a trabeculectomy. Now, myopia has been uh, cited as a risk factor for causing hypotony maculopathy post-glaucoma filtration surgery. And this is not just limited to trabeculectomy, it extends to tube shunt surgery and even MIGS. So uh, when we are doing myopes, it's a good idea to do a thorough workup and have a plan at hand uh, to prevent uh, post-operative hypotony. Having a higher pressure post the trabeculectomy is not a problem, but we should never, never go down low on the intraocular pressure, so a tight closure is, is really warranted in patients who are high myopes. When it comes to surgical technique, we all know that limbus-based uh, conjunctival flaps, uh, especially in younger people, they tend to have a ring of steel formation because of recruitment of inflammatory cells, but these flaps are also more prone to have suture granulomas that may compress the blood. So uh, most of us have shifted to fornix-based flaps, and uh, we should avoid self-sealing scleral flaps as well. Not only this, the non-compliance with post-operative care, you have taken care of all the factors that I have already talked about, but the patient is not compliant with the post-operative regime, and inflammation is going to take over. Many patients who come from rural areas and they are not able to come for a frequent follow-up in the first week, they tend to miss out on their drugs and many a times the subtle signs of subconjunctival fibrosis, we are not able to pick it up and address them in time. And so these patients are more likely to have um, risk of uh, failing bled. So for, it is really important that when you are planning surgery and explaining to your patient to emphasize the fact that in the first 10 days, the follow-up is critical and they may need to come several times. Because the early anterior chamber and bleb architecture management is pivotal for the success of the surgery. 
Now, when we have to stratify and explain to our patients about how, what outcome to expect from trabeculectomy, it's a good idea to club these risk factors and then prognosticate. So one of the study that was um, published way back in 2016 showed that if there are no two low risk factors or zero risk factor, the outcome is good. And as the number of risk factors increases, it becomes more difficult to address this. Choroidal detachment, if we talk of a risk factor specific for this complication, high preoperative intraocular pressure, presence of pressure, intraocular pressure less than nine on the first post-op day, male and after penetrating glaucoma surgery more likely. Persistent hypotony is more likely in patients who have had a limbus-based conjunctival flap or a lower preoperative intraocular pressure. And if they've had a choroidal detachment that occurs six, within the six months of performing the surgery. So this was one of my patients who developed post-operative choroidal detachment. At the time of surgery, there was tight closure, the AC was well formed, the bleb was well formed, and it all seemed great. But this patient was a hypertensive patient on oral uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and multiple AGMs. And uh, two days post trabeculectomy, I see a uh, choroidal detachment. Fortunately, the patient responded to AC reformation with Helon, but uh, multiple medications and hypertensive patients are more prone to this. We must look forward for, uh, we must look at uh, the higher preoperative intraocular pressure and hematological abnormalities because this can make the patient prone to develop decompression, retinopathy. Hyphema and choroidal hemorrhage are more common in patients who are on anticoagulation therapy, highest risk being with warfarin, and in patients who have high risk, uh, bridging therapy is really important. Um, this is one of my patients who was on warfarin, although I had stopped it in conjunction with the internist, but the patient eventually did land up with a decompression re retinopathy, had vitreous hemorrhage on day two after the surgery, which cleared over three weeks on its own. Malignant glaucoma is likely uh, with patients who are hyperopes and have shallow anterior chambers. So this is something that we have to be very particular about because in India we have a lot of uh, patients with the primary angle closure glaucoma. And uh, this patient had uh, a malignant glaucoma and post PPV, the AC is formed both centrally and uh, peripherally. In a nutshell, doing a preoperative homework and prepping the patient well explaining to them what all can happen and why a meticulous follow-up in the early post-operative period is important so that we can get a good post-operative outcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Parvi. <clears throat> any, any questions? I think the Parvi has covered a lot of things. Um, yes, please. question is addressed to ma'am. Uh, after release of uh, the two releasable sutures post trabeculectomy, do you get high IOP and then do you consider ALS for the last remaining flap, uh, remaining suture on the flap and what is the ideal timing for the ALS in, this, in these cases? No, you mean you've removed the releasable yes. and the pressure is still high? Yeah. Yeah, so most likely that will be because the scleral flap has probably started fibrosing down and uh, it's unlikely that re removing even more will help. You'll probably need to needle it or do something to revise that bleb, I would think, that once it's out. And uh, like Dr. Pandav said, seven to 14 weeks is the time when it would try a massage, even if that doesn't work, then maybe you'll have to resort to a needling or something. And doing a laser suture analysis of a second suture after removing the first rarely actually works too well. You, you have to look at that way. So <clears throat> you have released a, you know, one or two sutures. And after that, is the bleb formed or not? Yes, the so bleb is forming on massage. So that's, that's very critical. Mm -hmm. So if the bleb is not formed, so that means problem is not, uh, you know, that means uh, the, the suture, release of suture has not actually worked. So the flap is already stuck. So you have to find some way to elevate that. In the early post operative period, even the bleb massage could do what, you know, the differential that you depress or the lip of the sclera just into the incision line and that can open, that can fish mouth it and then the fluid can come out. Or you make sure that the ostium is not blocked. So you have to do gonioscopy and see. Then so the, basically no the ostium is not but blocked, the suppose, massage is working, yeah, but now, it's the sutures yeah, so that So now tight. we have released the suture and there's a fluid yeah. 
in the under the conjunctiva and the tenon, right? Yeah. So there's a fluid there. Yeah. So releasing extra suture will not work because the fluid is already coming into that mm. place. Because the primary objective of the releaser suture is to make sure that the blev area co communicates with the anterior chamber, and that we have already established uh, automatically or by after releasing the uh, one or two of the sutures. Now the pressure is high. So the problem now is that because their blev is not functioning well, right? So w what could that be? That, that means your blev is actually getting localized perhaps. So you, you know, because now that fluid that I mentioned earlier, now we had dumped fluid into the subconjunctal space, but there's no way that this fluid will go into the, where it should go. So it's getting stagnant, there's getting tap there. So best thing is in the early post period, you try to take that fluid out of that small area. And Dr. Sushmita mentioned that you massage those blebs. With the, in the early post period, when the fibrovascular tissue is still forming, you can actually create, you know, some, uh, with the massage directly onto the bleb, you can, you know, push that fluid in the sub, you know, adjacent tissue, and you can create some gaps in the fibrosis which is happening. So don't let that ring of steel form, and then you kind of try to get, the, get those blebs flatter, because at this point of time, the IOP will go up, then the bleb will start becoming more prominent and it will be local. It might gain in height, there might be vascularity. So other thing would be at that point uh, to look at would be how the vascularity is happening in the blab. So diffuse the blab, give a massage, and if it's becoming like this, you see there's a more vascularization of the blab, and that might be the time when you could supplement your, uh, your anti-metabolite. So mm -hmm. you could give 5 fluid uh, injection in the post-operative period to supplement uh, if you are given on table, or if you if, if you're not given on table, then you have to do that now. So, and so at that point, I think uh, your emphasis should be to get that fluid out of that limited area. And the best thing to do would be to cut down the inflammation. You might use antimitotic if required, but best thing would be to massage that blood and let blood and let that fluid go out of that. Don't let that fluid get trapped into a small area. If it gets trapped in the small area, then that gets further localized. And after that, you know, releasing suture or laser suture lysis will not work. And after that, only needling would be the option left. So as Dr. Shushita mentioned. Okay. So sir, how long we can observe these patients on high IOP, say around 24, uh, with massage uh, I think uh, you have to see what is working or not. Uh, you keep the pressure low with anti, uh, anti glaucoma medicine, uh, adjust your anti-inflammatory and other things and uh, keep massaging this blood, blood and I think blood massage works even later. So mm -hmm. it depends whether you are succeeding or not. So after blood massage, if you can see, you can actually see the fluid going yeah. in the stretch lab. You can see the fluid, you know, going around. And the if, IOP also drops. And uh, IOP also drops. Mm -hmm. If that's happening, so keep doing it as long as that, that's happening. But if when that stops happening, that means now you have gone beyond mm -hmm. the recovery point. Mm -hmm. So you have to take some other measure. Excuse me. Uh, I, I have, have a question, question with uh, I have two questions. One is that do you always uh, do trabeculectomy with antifibrotics or you customize? Always. always. So even if it's a virgin case, also you try with this? Yes. Patients and from whom you think like I would, this? I would only possibly uh, uh, modulate the concentration. Maybe in an absolutely virgin con conjunctiva 0 0.02, but uh, I've shifted to 0 0.04 in most. So most of our traps are virgin conjunctiva. It's the first surgery that they're, they're doing. And always MMC or 5 if you also you consider? No, on table, MMC, but post-operatively we need it, then uh, 5 if you, 5 milligram. Thanks. Another thing is uh, in, in some of my patients, one I, high myop, of course, one I showed hypotony. Hypotonus maculopathy, not only hypotony, hypotonus maculopathy. So other eye also needs uh, the trabeculectomy. What could be the precautions and uh, lower MMC, lower concentration because they are very thin stretch scleras. But if the glaucoma is not too bad, try a mix. I mean, try, try something without having to cut open sclera and uh, But open I'm not very uh, <laughs> confident about me. Yeah, so I mean if I'm just saying if it is a mild or moderate case, which is not being, so sometimes that helps. But uh, I, I suppose tight suturing, viscoelastic intraoperatively, avoid hypotony, 
and lower the dose of MMC. Or not okay. at all, don't use. Something. Not at all is, I don't know, it somehow never was. I, I don't do not at all. I, I, would, I would always use MMC. Yeah, but I mean, if you have more concerns, I think you can avoid using them. You can do it post-operatively. Post-operative injection. Y you field. could five fluoro yourself post-operatively. Thank you. Yeah, some more questions, uh, please keep, uh, yeah, yes, please. Uh, my question is about this early bleb failure, uh, like the previous question. Uh, after suture lysis, the bleb has still not raised, pressures are high, so suspecting um, fibrosis, subconjunctival, or at subscleral level. So for a young uh, glaucoma surgeon, ma'am, can you uh, tell the step-by-step -step, uh, method of uh, bleb needling with antimetabolite? Uh, like what is your preferred needle used, what gauge, and... Uh, preferred antimetabolite used? Uh, I'll show I you the I bleb. I think sir's I'll talk show you a video, bleb yes. needling video I'll show you. Yeah. Okay. 